Good evening. Hello. Um, I think we can make a start. Um, are we ready now, Eva? Fantastic. So, hello and um, good evening and welcome to members and friends of BSN Citigroup and BSN Midlands. And of course, members of the African Caribbean Society at Cambridge University with whom we're collaborating on this event. It's great to have you all with us and a very warm welcome. This is the first session in our series on authenticity and the importance of being true to who we are. I'm Paulette Maston and I'm chair of the Black Solicitors Network and council at Linklaters. I've been wanting us to host this series of events um, for some time now. So it's great to have this opportunity to kick off the series with this headline event on imposter syndrome and finding your power. I'm sure that for many, particularly people of color, Striving to succeed in corporate spaces and environments as a minority can be a constant battle against feelings of self-doubt, a fear of failure, of being found out or exposed, feelings of not being good enough, and, and often not properly believing or owning our own successes and achievements. If you struggle with this mindset, this sort of negative inner voice, then chances are you have imposter syndrome. But don't take it from me, we just so happen to know someone who has written a book on the subject. The book is called Be the First, People of Colour, Imposter Syndrome and the Struggle to Succeed in a White World. I can tell you it's an insightful and illuminating read and it's available on Amazon. I'm delighted that the author Caroline Flanagan is joining us this evening to unpack the root causes of imposter syndrome and share some practical tools on how to solve it and unlock more, unlock more of our potential and confidence. She will also, I hope, share her inspiring journey from humble beginnings in Birmingham to Cambridge University and then to the city as a finance lawyer at a Matic Circle firm, so she knows about these struggles firsthand. Today, Caroline is an inspirational keynote speaker, certified coach, author of two books, host of two podcasts and creator of The Imposter Speech. She's also the proud mother of four boys. As I touched on before, she's a Magic Circle trained ex-city lawyer who now works with international law firms, banks and other global organizations to increase the number of women and people of color in leadership. Her mission is to empower minority individuals to defy the odds, triumph over adversity and win battles they think they cannot win. Before I hand over to Caroline, I should mention that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of Caroline's talk using the Q&A function online. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Caroline. Welcome. Thank you so much, Paulette. Thank you for having me, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you too. Panic, sheer and utter panic, and not of anxiety in the pit of my stomach, my heart pounded in my chest. And worst of all, worse than any of that, that voice in my head that I've heard over and over again over the years saying, Caroline, stop. That thing you're trying to do, that task you're trying to complete, that goal you're trying to achieve, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be doing that. If you take that next step, if you raise your hand, make yourself visible, you'll be exposed and you'll lose everything. Welcome to imposter syndrome. I'm Caroline Flanagan and in addition to all the wonderful things that Paulette has said about me, I want you to know that I'm passionate about empowering you to win those battles that you think you cannot win. So this battle we're talking about today it's imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, it's real. And it's being fought every single day by people just like you in high performing environments, just like where you are. And in fact, 
depending on which bit of research you choose to believe, it affects between 60 to 90% of you, which means every single one of you on this call has either experienced imposter syndrome yourself, or you know somebody, have worked with somebody who has too. Now, a number of years ago, I had what I like to call my imposter syndrome crisis. I'd reached the point of complete desperation. I was exhausted, quite frankly, by that need to keep showing up, to keep trying to overcome those feelings of self-doubt. I'd had enough of the ambitious me. I'd had enough of trying to survive in what felt like so often a hostile environment. I was ready to turn my back on all that ambition, all that achievement, all that recognition. But I didn't turn my back on anything. And I'm here presenting, speaking to you today, more courageous, more bold, more ambitious, and more successful than I ever imagined I would be. And not in spite of my imposter syndrome, but because of it, because I learned to turn my imposter syndrome into a strength. And today I wanna to show you how you can do the same too. So here's what's coming up over the next 50 minutes or so. I'm going to share a bit of my story and in that talk about imposter syndrome, how it's impacted me, particularly as a person of colour. And in that, I want you to listen out for any things that resonate with you that reflect your own experience. I'm then going to talk about you. I'm going to ask you some questions about that experience that you have. And I encourage you, talk to me on the, the Q&A share with me your own experiences and engage. I wish we could be in the same room together and I could be looking you eye to eye and us having a conversation. But all we have, we have Zoom and we have the Q&A box. So I urge you, we can still make this as engaging and most importantly, as relevant to you as possible by interacting with me on the Q&A. So I want to have that section where we talk about you. And then I'm going to share with you my tool, my powerful, portable tool that I've created that will help you to turn your imposter syndrome into a strength, to find your power in that imposter syndrome. So how is that sounding for everybody by way of introduction? Is everybody in the right room, at the right event, and happy with what's coming up? You could test out the Q&A if you like and put a yes, go for it Caroline, something in there for me to see and acknowledge. Fantastic, great. Lots of people saying, yes, we're in the right event. I'm in the right room. It's always good to know as a speaker when you can't see everyone in the audience. Thank you for that. Now, if you've been at all curious about me before today, you may have perhaps Googled me. Maybe you looked me up on LinkedIn. I know a couple of you did because you've already reached out to me and connected, which is fantastic. And I hope many more of you will too. And what you would have seen there it's not dissimilar to how Paula introduced me. You would have seen the university I went to. You would have seen the Magic Circle law firms I worked at. You would have seen the caliber of clients that I now work with, all of my achievements, things I've been recognized for. But those are just facts. They're great facts. They're facts I'm very, very proud of, but they only tell you what I've done. What they don't tell you is who I am. According to the UK children's charity, Bernardo's, children of offending parents are twice as likely to have misconduct and behavioral problems. They are significantly likely to drop out of school and they are three times as likely to end up as repeat offenders themselves. And my family, we did more than our fair share of contributing to that data. Siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, parents, back and forth from prison, arrested, police around all the time. That was my childhood. And yet my path was strangely different. At the age of six, I found myself transported off to an all white boarding school from the ninth floor of a block of flats in Bromford in Birmingham to a white boarding school. 
And don't even ask me how that happened. All I know is that one day I was surrounded by people who looked like me sneaking downstairs with my one of my brothers making sugar and white bread sandwiches in the middle of the night to being the only person of colour in an all white school. I remember those pictures, it's one black smiley face in a sea of white faces. That was 1978. Now I know your lawyer brains will be calculating and trying to work out how old I am. So just to get that bit over with, I'm 21. So it's 1978 and interestingly that very year, Two American psychologists, Dr. Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes, they noticed a very curious phenomenon in some of their clinical patients. They were extremely high achieving women, but who really struggled to internalize their success. They felt it was all down to luck and they had this ongoing anxiety that any minute now, somebody would tap them on the shoulder and expose them as a fraud. Boy, did those feelings resonate with me. What they described as the imposter phenomenon soon became what we know as imposter syndrome. And I felt it, that feeling of being a fraud, of not deserving my success, that it was all dependent on a luck that was about to imminently run out and that threat of exposure. But what Clance and Imes described as an inner feeling of intellectual phoniness was just half the story for me. The rest was the external reality. I didn't just feel like an imposter. I was treated like one by the music teacher who would call questions, call questions out in the classroom and he would single out my friends and Joanna and Paul and Michael and Rachel, tell me what you think. And then he would point a finger over to the back of the room and he would yell, lady of the jungle, why do you never speak up in these lessons? It was a reality that was reflected to me by my closest friends who would say things to me like, Caroline, you're not like normal black people at all. You're funny, you're interesting, you're quite clever, you're fun to be around. But I excelled. I worked so hard at that school. I won every prize. I set every sporting record and I topped the leadership board in every category. And guess what my reward was? I got to go to the next school and be the only black face in another sea of white faces. I got to go to Cambridge and be one of a handful of black people at Cambridge University at that time. I got to then go on to law school, be one of a sprinkling, on to Alan Overy, on to Cleary Gottlieb. And so it continues. And even today, 99% of my talks, of the events, of the people that I coach in corporate environments, in law firms, I'm almost always the only person of colour in the room, always the minority, always the imposter. So I know exactly what it's like to experience the pain of imposter syndrome, to feel crippled by self-doubt and to question the right to be here and to have that mirrored back to you in the microaggressions, in every racist comment, in every in-joke that you don't understand and every cultural norm that you've never previously been exposed to. I know exactly what that's like and, and how powerless that can make you feel. And the loneliness, the isolation, the anxiety that those experiences create. Now, of course I succeeded in spite of that, but that success before I had this imposter syndrome crisis, that success was driven by fear and limited by a very narrow focus on what I hoped I could achieve. But this, this success I'm living right now, this success is driven by courage, by commitment, by determination, by a sense of purpose, and by an understanding and real acknowledgement of what I'm capable of. In other words, it's a success that's driven not by 
what I do, what I can do in that moment, how perfect I can make a piece of work. It's a success that's driven by who I am. And that kind of success is the most powerful. That kind of way to show up is the most powerful. It means I'm not gonna be distracted by the lack of diversity around me. I'm not interested in the illusion that the rest of the world needs to decide to include me before I can succeed. I'm not trapped in the confusion of whether I'm being authentic or not and what that means to me. And I'm not gonna let any racism, racist comments, racial stereotypes block me from my success. I found my power and I want you to find yours too. And I'm gonna give you a tool that's gonna to help you do that. But before we get to that, let's talk about you. I want to know from you, what is your experience? Is imposter syndrome something that is alive and rife in you at the moment? Let me know on the chat if this is something that's resonating with you right now. I'm seeing some yeses already coming up on the chat. Yeah, deeply, it resonates really deeply with me, says one of you. What about the rest of you? Any of this making sense? What's really ringing home for you right now in what I've said? Now I've talked about the emotion, that's how I started. I talked about the panic, the knot of anxiety in my stomach and my pounding heart and the voice in my head. What's your self-doubt like? What's your experience? What emotions come up for you? How do you know you're experiencing imposter syndrome? What does it feel like? Let's have a look. Yes, I'm here and getting lots of yeses. And yes, I experience it partly. It resonates with me. When asked about ambitions, seeing myself as a partner, it's scary as there's no one like me. Yeah. And what's that feeling, that fear? Right, it manifests in your body. It's quite physical, isn't it? But what I also want to know is, where's the balance for you between the internal and the external? So I've talked about the, the self-doubt bit, the bit internal, the inner voice. And that's the bit that Clance and Imes talked about. They, that's what they de um, described as imposter, imposter phenomenon and the imposter syndrome. But they couldn't know about the external piece. They couldn't know about what it means to be the only person in the room and to have that reflected back to you. And is that the same case for you? And the third question for you is, well, what's at stake here? You know, honestly, the number of times I'm told, well, you know, okay, so you've got imposter syndrome, but what's the big deal? You've still gone on to achieve uh, things. You still, it's not exactly um, held you back or made you a failure. So what's the big deal? And that's a question for you. As you go out into the world and you are experiencing maybe moments that trigger imposter syndrome, what is it about those moments that make it something that you're invested in trying to resolve? Or are you invested in trying to resolve? Is this topic just something of interest to you or is it something you actually want to do something about, move on from? I want to ask you a question. If you still feel the same way about being the only one in the room, if you still feel like an imposter and that holds you back, if you are still being held hostage by the self-doubt and being impacted by your external environment and you feel that's holding you back, making you question your ability, question your ambition, question what you want to do. If you still feel all of that one year from now, how will you feel? Will that matter? What about five years from now? What about 10 years from now, if you are still being held back by these same limiting feelings? How will you feel? I know for me, what was at stake was more than just whether I could do the task in front of me, whether I could raise my hand in meetings, whether I could put myself forward for that next opportunity that I knew I was supposed to reach for. It stopped being about those individual moments and started to become something else entirely. It started to become about my self-worth, about who I was, who I wanted to be 
in the world and whether I was really up to the job, up to being myself, being true to myself. And it started to be about my well-being as well. So that's why I got to the point of having what I call this imposter crisis. I couldn't take it anymore. So I'm just going to bring up my chat. So what I've realized, everybody, is that we're putting lots and lots of comments in the chat box. And I've been looking in the Q&A. So I've got those comments up now in the chat. And it's, I'm delighted to see all of the comments that you've been contributing. Lots of yeses. Yeah. Um, lots of it being too familiar, all too familiar, what I've shared with you. You're feeling out of place, feeling anxious, struggling with finding the balance of being neglected because you're black and treating your success as undeserved. Gosh, being the token black person. How many times have I heard that? How it's showing up for you, feeling like you don't belong and that you'll be found out. And that external piece, I can see that too. That's a really real experience for you. People questioning everything you do and how that makes you feel, how it makes you query whether you're good enough. Was it a mistake, one of you says. And yes, I can see the cost for you is huge too, right? What's at stake? Mental health, the lack of peace, the feeling like a failure. Amazing responses. Thank you so much for sharing how real all of these experiences are for you. And one thing I want to say, and this is really important, I think everybody can see um, the chat, is what a feature of imposter syndrome is that feeling that it's just you, that everybody else has got it worked out, that everybody else is so much more self-assured than you. And one of the things I love about these sessions is what it says about how pervasive this feeling is. And the message I wanted you to take away from that is that you are not alone and in those moments when you are feeling isolated no you are not alone so when such there are such high stakes when we're talking about changing something so that it's not still haunting us holding us back and we're living with that regret that feeling 10 years from now we need bigger solutions I'm constantly asked, well, what are the tips? What are the tricks for getting over my imposter syndrome? And I say in a bit of a kind of, <laughs> in a bit of a strut, I say, I don't do tips. I don't do tricks. This isn't about tips and tricks. Your imposter syndrome is not going to be fixed, go away, uh, overcome with tips and tricks. It's too important. It's too ingrained. It's too deep. We need something more. And that's where I found myself. In that moment of my crisis, I was tired of the quick fixes that would get me by maybe one day, maybe a week, but then all of the demons would be back again. I'd be back to square one. I needed something more. So I did the one thing that I hadn't tried. I looked at my imposter syndrome. I looked at the fact that it was always there, that it never went away and that nothing ever works in the long term. And I thought, doesn't matter how much I achieve, I've got a catalogue of success. If it worked, just doing well and being told you've done well and being recognised, if that worked and would sort your imposter syndrome out and make it go away, I would be all for it. I would be telling you, go out there, achieve another goal and you'll be fine. But you and I know that's not how it works. Look at what you've achieved and how, how insignificant that is to the voice in your head that's questioning whether you should be there, questioning what you're doing or how well you're doing it and how other people are treating you. So the first thing I wanna tell you is that imposter syndrome doesn't care about the truth. It doesn't care about how many successes are you have to your name or where you work or how well you do. Your imposter syndrome is here to stay and that's okay. Because the problem isn't the imposter syndrome. It's not even the emotions, that negative emotions, if you like to call them, that we experience in a moment. The problem isn't that. The problem is what we make imposter mean about us. I see it as us starting a conversation with ourselves that we then forget to continue. It's asking a question of you when your imposter syndrome is triggered that you have forgotten how to answer. So the second thing I want you to take away is that your imposter syndrome is not 
a problem you need to solve, a, a problem you need to fix or overcome or get rid of. Don't get rid of it. It is integral to who you are. Your story is wrapped up in your imposter syndrome, just the way I've shown you that mine is too. You don't need or want to get rid of that. All you need to do is understand your imposter syndrome, what it's trying to do. It's a puzzle you need to solve. It's the question, who am I? When those feelings are triggered, when you're feeling that way, who am I? And it's your job to answer that question. And that's what I wanna teach you how to do. When I learned how to answer that question, well, first of all, before I tell you when I learned how to answer it, how about how I, how I answered it? I went digging, I went exploring. If I am an imposter, if I had this imposter syndrome, it's not just that I feel like an imposter. It's not even just that it's mirrored back to me and people are treating me like an imposter. When I looked at the root cause of it and some of that, not all of it, some of it I shared with you today, very honestly, very openly, very rawly, when I dug deep into that, I realized one thing. There's, there are grains of truth in my imposter syndrome. I feel like an imposter because I am one. I have no business being here. I had no business going to Cambridge from my council flat in Bromford. I had no business working at a place like Alan and Nobody when at the time of doing my exams, I was being evicted and battling stuff at home that no one of my peers could even have imagined. It's interesting, I've written about some of it in my book and the number of messages or calls I had when the book came out that said, oh my God, I never knew, I had no idea. How was all of that going on while you were working at a and or working at Cleary? That's the stuff that I found as being, of course, the root cause of why I felt like I didn't belong. I just had to look at the sea of white faces I was surrounded by. Of course, I'm an imposter. But here's what's amazing about that realization. There was nothing to fight anymore. There was nothing to resist anymore. I didn't have to be caught up in all of the things that I was not or was not good enough doing. I was free to acknowledge and make peace with who I was, but it gets better. This wasn't just, oh, accepting that I'm the way, way I am. It went further into, wow, well, what does that say about me if all of those things are true? What does it say about the successes that I have achieved? What does it say about the decisions I have made and the motivation that I have found to get where I am today and to keep moving forward? What does it say about the kind of person I am to get through what I've been through, to fall and pick myself up, to fail and find a way to keep going, to want to give up, but find something in me that keeps on fighting. What does that say about me? I talked about having the knowledge and understanding of what I'm capable of. That's where it comes from. And finally, it's about understanding it's not really just about me. I always find that bit a little bit tricky. I never wanted to be the token person. I never wanted to be the one who does things for other people as if I had a responsibility to be that person. And I'm sure many of you will have had that feeling, feel that pressure, the people who are coming up behind you, those who are looking, watching to see what you do, expecting you to be a role model. It's a lot of pressure. It feels like something I know I felt I didn't want. But there's one thing I really learned that's so important. Those goals, those day-to-day -day goals that you set for yourself, the promotion or the being valued or the next step, whatever it is for you, when that gets tough, when the environment around you is challenging, makes you want to give up, makes you want to turn back, being able to recognize a sense of purpose and see what is going on beyond yourself, the kind of impact you're gonna have. That's what can make the struggle worth it. It's not the reason why you do it. The reason why you do it is to achieve your goals, but when you understand in those moments, I can't tell you how powerful it is for me 
in the moments when I doubt myself, when my imposter syndrome is triggered, to say to myself, it's not about you. It's so freeing. This is not about me. This is about the work that I'm here to do. And the more clear you are on how what your immediate goals connect with a bigger purpose, something more important, something as simple as being a role model to your younger brother or sister or to your own children or just getting home at the end of the day and have the person a person that you know and admire and loves you know and, and love say you're doing a great you're doing a great you really inspired me with what you did today that's the kind of purpose that can make struggle completely different struggle that's worth it so the tool I want to share with you today is called the imposter speech and the reason why I created it is because in that moment where I had my imposter syndrome crisis, which was actually my imposter syndrome epiphany, enlightenment, I wanted to capture that feeling that it gave me to do that exploration, to dig and to come out with that gold, that golden knowledge, that valuable knowledge of all the assets I have, if you like, how I felt when I was able to step into the truth of who I am, not in this moment right now, as I'm trying to get a piece of work done or deliver on a project, but who I am in my entirety, all those things I just talked about, the decisions I've made, the successes I've had, the way I've been able to bounce back from failure, the sense of purpose, that, all of that is who I am. And what I wanted to do, what I realized is that every time I faced a challenge, if I could tap into the power of who I am, of all that I am, the way I showed up was completely different. Diversity distraction, inclusion illusion, authenticity trap, racism roadblock. I show up as who I am. I'm showing up in my fullest power. You can't stop me. How do we package that? How do we make it practical? How can we call on it time and time again? I created the imposter speech as like a short statement that you write, you create yourself out of your own value. You go digging, you go mining for the nuggets in your story. There is no one like you. No one can do what you do the way you do it, bringing all that you can bring to it. And you need to be able to access the energy and the power of that in every single moment where your imposter syndrome is triggered. In every single moment, ideally, but when your imposter syndrome is triggered, the point is what makes it so strong and powerful for you is you can use that as an invitation. You can see that as not a distraction of who you're not, but as an opportunity to step into who you are in your entirety. So the imposter speech is composed of five steps and they're very, very simple. You answer five questions. The first question is, who are you? Now the answer to that is misleading. It's just your name. I am Caroline Flanagan. But when I say my name, how I feel when I say my name is all the power of who I am because I have my imposter speech. So your first step is to answer the question, who, I, who am I? And be able to say, I am, and then your name, but say it in a way that connects you to the core of your identity. That means whatever relationship you have with your name, it has to be the most powerful relationship out there because it represents who you are. What does that mean? It means taking control of your name. It means if somebody pronounces your name incorrectly, not making that about them, about the disrespect that that might mean, about what they're trying to say. It's nothing to do with them. Your name is yours. You have to own your name, step into it. If you want people to get it right, proudly explain to them how to get it right. Tell them how important it is. Do not give your power away by making how respected you feel, how 
your sense of belonging is dependent on whether some random person who is called Mark James, who's never ever experienced anyone not be able to pronounce their name before, some random person, let them decide how you feel when you are in a room. It's your name, you own it. Nobody can do anything to it to take that away. So clean up your relationship with your name. If you don't like your name, you need to do some work on that and find a way to embrace your name and find working with a client at the moment on this very thing. And we're creating his imposter speech and the work we're doing on his name is unbelievable how important that is and has been for him, how transformative. It has literally been the single most powerful thing in creating a barrier between him and everybody he works with. And that barrier has just been crumbling down as we've done the work on him taking ownership of his name. So the first question is, who am I? And that's your name. The second question is, where am I? And the answer is not just the success of wherever you are, you might, whether you're at Cambridge or whether you are already practicing or wherever you are, it's all of the successes. If you imagine looking in your rear view mirror, I want you to be able to map your successes, the stepping stones to where you are now. And just pick one or two that really resonate with you and remind you that you didn't just land where you are now from on high. You didn't just wake up where you are today. There's a whole route, like a route map that you have followed in order to get here. And you need to be able to conjure up those stepping stones to success. The third question is, why am I here? What are the decisions that you made that led you to this point? Because you did make them. You did choose this. Now, it's amazing how many of my clients or how often I hear that, well, I'm just ended up falling into this or my parents thought it was the right thing for me to do or it was the obvious next step or everybody was following this route. I didn't really choose to be where I am. And, you know, the next the next um, comment alongside that is and therefore I should I should give up on this. It's not the right place for me. I should be going somewhere else. You chose this. You chose this for a reason. I want you to go back. I want you to go back to understanding and giving yourself, yeah, understanding the integrity of your decisions that have led you here. Something in you thrives on achievement, thrives on the challenge, enjoys the kind of people you get to interact with at this level. Find that motivation by answering, why am I here? The fourth step, arguably the most important, answer the question, how did I get here? Now, this is different to the successes. Most of us, we want to go to the successes, don't we? We take comfort in those. But I want to tell you, you need to go to the failures. You need to go to the places where you don't want to think about, you don't want to remember those times you had that horrible feedback, you didn't get the job, you had that rejection. Yeah, you were treated go to those places, but I don't want you to wallow in the misery of that experience. What I want you to do is to connect with what you did next, how somehow you picked yourself up, how somehow you managed to, however difficult and stressed and painful it was, how you were feeling, you somehow found something in you to keep going. That, my friend, is where your power lies. All those times that people don't even know what it took of you, that's what you're capable of. And that's the power I want you to be able to step into in those moments you're the only one in the room and somebody is perhaps treating you in a way that's making you feel threatened or you're feeling like you don't belong to be there. Tap into that power that is proven that you have a check record of. And then, as I've said, do the work on your purpose. That's the fifth step. Answer the question, why am I here? And there's two parts to that. The goal, what do you want to achieve? You do have the next goal, right? You do know what that is. And I ask that because it's amazing how lots of people get to a certain level and go, I don't really know what my goal is or what I want. Okay, we need to work on that. Of course, the imposter syndrome when it strikes is going to keep you in turmoil if you don't even know where you're going, what you're trying to achieve. And that key bit I talked about, the underlying purpose that makes those moments of struggle all the more powerful and about something that's bigger than you. That's the imposter speech. If you can show up 
as who you are to those moments in which you feel most challenged, how you show up and the results that you will produce will astound you. I know that. I've seen it in my clients and I'm living it every day. Use your imposter speech. Every moment where you might want to give up, where you don't believe in yourself, show up from who you are, not what you're doing, but as who you are and the results will astound you. You'll no longer, in fact, you'll never again be the only one in the room. You show up as who you are and you will always be the first. So looks like we've got some questions, which is amazing. So I'm now going to hand back over to Paulette, I think, who is going to get us started with the Q&A. And I see quite a few of you asking, what was the five again? Um, what we'll do is we'll make sure that goes on the chat. I will repeat it in answering some of the questions as well and make sure that's absolutely clear for you. So don't worry. Handing you over to Paulette now. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline, for sharing what I can only describe as thought leadership, um, your, your vulnerability, your authenticity, your openness. Um, really appreciate that. Um, this is such a deeply important subject. Um, so lots, lots and lots of learning. I, I could go on. Um, I have one question before we go to the Q&A session, and it's this. How do you find or navigate that balance between being your authentic self and progressing your career as, as a person of colour? Yeah, thank you. So um, such an important question, one I get a lot, the authenticity piece. So here's what I want to say by way of advice for that is I want you to solve one problem at a time, by which I mean I want you to take each situation and evaluate it on its merits. Because one of the things that I can't tell you to do, or give you the answer to is, how do you go forward and always stay authentic? Because of course, there are so many different situations in which your authenticity, you may feel your authenticity is being challenged. In some of those, maybe it is being challenged. In others, it won't be being challenged. There is so much about the situation itself that you need to like have a look at and understand before you can make a decision about what's the authentic next step to you. So I guess the takeaway for that question, and it applies to, to lots of those sort of generic questions, it's a response to the fact that it's very easy to do the all or nothing thinking. My firm is not diverse. I'm not included. All these very broad sweeping statements that honestly, even I, you know, with all my experience, I don't know how to, it's like saying, how can we solve world peace? Yeah. How do we solve world peace? We solve it one situation at a time. How do we get rid of world hunger? We solve it one community at a time. So I want you to do that is to really focus on the issue at hand and evaluate it from that point. Okay. So we bring it down and we take exactly what the situation is in front of me. If I was coaching you, for example, I would say, okay, so tell me what's going on. What is it about the situation that you feel is a threat to your authenticity? Okay, so it makes you question uh, aspects, something A about you. Okay, so what is it about that particular thing about you that makes you, that you think makes you be authentic? And what I've, what I've found in a lot of the conversations I have around authenticity is that people are holding on to ideas of themselves, of what is their authentic self, that they've just held on to or accumulated over time and haven't necessarily chosen. So I want to say that about authenticity is to look at, first of all, can you articulate what makes you authentic? What is your authentic self? Could you actually write it down in a list? And the reason why that's important is because often we feel the physical um, emotion, right, of a threat. And what we do is we call it a threat to our authenticity without really knowing what it is and breaking it down and knowing what to do with it. So I want to challenge you to not saying that it's not a threat to your authenticity, but I want to challenge you to really be clear about what you're saying is going on, what you're holding on to, and that what you're holding on to is chosen and something you want. Hopefully that helps, it. Hugely, hugely. So one has to be quite specific um, yeah. about the, the situation. Yeah. Um, 
So we could carry on that conversation, um, but thank, thank you for that. I will now hand over to Carl Blackburn, who is the co-chair of BSN Midlands to moderate the Q&A going forward. Great. Over to Carl. Thanks, Paulette. And uh, again, thanks, Caroline. Um, so I'm uh, an insolvency solicitor at JMW and co-chair of BSN Midlands and, and hugely uh, grateful to Caroline. Um, I had a number of questions myself, and as you're going through, just crossing them off, thinking, oh, you've answered fantastic. <laughs> oh, good. Um, I'm glad. <laughs> so we've got a few here, which I think are really, really interesting questions. Um, the first one, how can you tell the difference between imposter syndrome and anxiety? Mm. Well, so my brain, first of all, goes to the fact that anxiety is a symptom of imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is what we call it, right? It's what we call the, the uh, condition, for want of a better word, the tendency to feel those very specific feelings, feeling like a fraud, that your success is down to luck and that you're going to be exposed. And all of those things create anxiety. So Carl, that question makes me think of a similar question, which is what's the difference between sort of self-doubt and imposter syndrome? Or what's the difference between anxiety and imposter? I actually honestly think it doesn't really matter what you call it. I think what matters is just how you solve for it and what you do with it. And it's about finding whatever works to Im improve your situation. So you could come to me and say, I've got anxiety. I would say, why, what's going on? And we'd solve for what's going on. You could come to me with the same issue, the same circumstance and call it impos imposter syndrome. I'd ask you the same question. So I don't want you to get too hung up in what it's called, whether it's anxiety or imposter syndrome. And I want you to focus more on how is it showing up in you? What is it about, what can you do that's gonna help you find your power in situations where you feel that powerlessness, yeah? And so, you know, what can I do? Is there something in the imposter speech, which is what I've given you today, that's going to help me step out of the emotion of my anxiety and into the sort of logic of who I am? Yeah, I agree, that sounds, thank you. Uh, another question that's come through is touching on one of the five steps, which is effectively self-reflection on, on um, negative experiences. Mm -hmm. How do you prevent that from transforming into self-sabotage effectively? Not going, it's doing the, the analysis mm -hmm. without... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is super important. I think this is an area that's really important. If you know you have, you know, a lot of us have places in our past where we don't tend to go, right? And it could be something as innocent as a breakup or with a partner or something, um, an ex-boyfriend or something in the background. And we know it's uncomfortable, we don't wanna go there, but we could safely go there by ourselves, right? And think, okay, well, this is what it took for me to get over there, get over that, or this is how I managed to get through the following weeks. And that's safe. There may be other things. I mean, the stuff that I dug up, you know, super painful for me at the time, super difficult. And I think one of the reasons why I was able to do that by myself and actually evolve this into a practical tool that will work for you is because I'm also, I'm a coach. I've been doing this work for a number of years and it's kind of been the thread of, it's drawing on my, my experience over years of understanding how the brain works um, and being able to, to, to navigate that. If you have difficult things in your past that you would rather avoid, I would just say have support in doing that. And that support Ideally, you know, the next obvious place is somebody who is trained in doing imposter speech coaching like myself. And then they will be in a position to say if there's something, you know, if that is something that needs the help of a counsellor or you taking it further, then they can advise you about needing that next step. So yes, if you know it's something that you don't feel safe doing by yourself, work with somebody who's qualified to help you. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, next question is, what's the best way to deal with microaggressions in the workplace? Mm. One microaggression at the time. <laughs> Straight to it, like it. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, look, Carl, so they, just, to, and I'm not being facetious there, but, you know, if you like, we could say, oh, there's just microaggressions all the time. And how do I deal with all the microaggressions? But you know, what kind of answer can I give you to that? Which microaggression? Is it someone making a comment about a different hairstyle? I don't know, decide whether you care or not, right? That's the answer to that. But maybe it's a more serious microaggression that does really bother you, in which case the, the solution is something else. So that's, that's what I mean about, almost I don't want you to talk in terms of, 
oh, I'm dealing with microaggressions in, in, in the office. What do I do? Take a situation. Take a situation, for example, it's a microaggression to continuously, someone to continuously get your name wrong, right? Or not call you ever by your name because they're trying to avoid pronouncing it. Now, I know for a fact, I do a lot of allyship coaching and programs, right? So I have in the room, I have the kind of majority culture, okay, which are pretty much about 19 out of 20 people in the room, and there might be the then lone person of colour in the room. And we have these very safe conversations about what's going on. And you know what's interesting that's come out of that is how many members of, you know, the sort of seemingly much more confident white majority don't use names that they struggle they're nervous about getting wrong they're so nervous about getting things wrong that they avoid using them and will avoid calling on somebody in a meeting for fear of getting the name wrong now while you're sitting there thinking this is a microaggression that's what you're missing you're missing that somebody's so unsure of themselves and so afraid of getting it wrong and of being aggressive towards you know towards you that they don't even use it so that's what i mean by solve it one situation at a time it's the, it's the most powerful, empowering solution. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I suppose kind of turning it on its head slightly in terms of given the typical black experience, generally, I think you have to be pretty tough, I think, to get through to even as far as university, you know, you'll have experienced a lot. Um, would, would you think that that perhaps once you've analyzed the issues could make us actually more resilient than, than some of our peers from that natural life experience we already have. Look, absolutely. I mean, whether we're more resilient than, than our peers, I, I don't know the answer to that. I have coached some people who are part of the, the majority culture who've had some really, really tough, really tricky um, experiences growing up too. Um, and so it's very hard to compare it. But what is absolutely certain is that every one of those challenges and the resilience that you have had to build up, it counts. It counts to building your value. And it's so important that you don't leave that behind, leave it on the table when you're then showing up. And you show up as less than you are when you've got all of that backstock of experience, of resilience to bring to future situations. So yeah, the more you've had it, the more powerful you can be in those situations. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We do have a few more questions, but um, Caroline, if you're okay, we just quickly answer probably just yeah. one more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the question is, how do you deal with the other feeling, especially when it's being reinforced by people in an environment where you're unsupported? Now, do you stick? and hope that it can resolve itself? Or do you eventually say, I've tried here, I need to move on, it's too negative for me? How do you deal with the other feeling? First of all, if you are the only person of colour in the room, then you are different, aren't you? I mean, that's really the truth of it. So there's the, the reality of the fact that you are the only person everybody else might be more the same or similar okay so I kind of want you to stop fighting the reality of that situation and here's the second thing I want to say that feeling as long as it is a feeling there is a lot of room within that feeling for you to step into your power as long as you have the feeling of being another and you are giving the credit for that feeling to everybody else outside of you. You're giving away all of your power. You're a victim. There's very little, very few options for you when you are powerless in that way. Everybody else is making me feel like the other. You can't control everybody else. So where does that leave you to go? That's the first thing. The other part is that when we have feelings, one thing we need to know about feelings is they are not objective. They also not, if you'll excuse the pun, black and white. Feelings are complex. So I could be the only one in the room and feel that everybody is treating me like an other. Or I could be in the only one in the room and feel aware that, that that's who I am, but be determined to be the first. And that's the whole distinction, right, between saying, I'm the only one in the room and how weak and vulnerable and like a victim that makes you feel. And that's where you're going to show up from if that's where your mindset is. You know, if nothing else, what I'm 
teaching or sharing with you today is that you can choose the mindset that says you are the first one in the room. And then when you show up as that person, it doesn't really matter what everybody is doing, what their reaction is. For a start, you won't see as much evidence uh, of being the other because you're not looking for it. Yeah. And secondly, you're too busy being in your own power to be intimidated or have others around you make the decision about whether you should stay or you should leave. So bring it back to you, I guess is the point, and make it about you and who you want to be in that room and not about everybody else. Definitely. And I think as somebody's just said, own it. And I think that's a fabulous yeah. piece of advice. Um, Caroline, that's been fantastic. Uh, I am conscious of time again. Um, I think it's just to say again, thank you so much. Um, there are other questions, but I suspect um, if people do pick up your book, which is Be the First, um, no doubt there'll be you know, plenty of wisdom in there for them to, uh, to pick up on. Any final words, Caroline? Always, always. I can't believe how quickly the time has gone. It's a good job we have time constraints. I could answer all of the questions all evening. Okay, so um, thank you so much, everybody, for the amazing engagement and for sharing with me and uh, being open to what I've shared with you today. I hope it's given you some food for thought. I hope it's challenged some of the thinking that you've have had up until this point. I always feel the combination of delivering, sharing my story with you and then having this interactive Q&A session. At the end of it, I always, I always feel like it changes me somehow. Every session on imposter syndrome, it's so varied, so broad a topic, and we all experience it so differently um, that I'm different now than I was at the beginning of this talk. And you are too. You can't unlearn or unhear what I've shared with you today and what we've discussed. So what I want to ask you is, what happens next for you? And what happens next is so much more important than what's happened here. How will you remember the message of today and the insights you've had a week from now? How will you start living it a month from now? And how will it still be relevant to you a year from now? So in order to kind of ask that, answer that question for you, I've got three next steps that I would like to propose and offer to you. The first one is to join my imposter syndrome community on Facebook. So the link is there. It may even be possible um, to put the link in the chat. I'm not sure if that's going to work raisily, but that's the link. And the point about the Facebook group is the questions I will ask um, the BSN amazing team behind the scenes if um, I can download the questions that you've asked today. And obviously lots of them I haven't had time to answer. And what I do is in that Facebook community, I'm going in, I'm answering those questions. I'm live there on a Monday evening, um, every single week, and, and I'm posting and answering these questions. So if you have a burning question you don't feel was answered today, that's the place to go. And that's where I'll be. We can carry on this conversation. For me, this is just the beginning. Uh, if you're not on Facebook, I know lots of you aren't, connect with me on LinkedIn and we'll find other ways to connect. The, the, the second option is to sign up to my newsletter. In fact, why not do that anyway? It goes out every week. Again, I'm all over. I'm loving the imposter syndrome. I can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of your questions. So stay connected with me. And then thirdly, as you've heard mentioned, I do have the book. And I mention that because the second half of the book is all about the imposter speech. It will literally walk you through those five steps. So I'll finish by just recapping. Who are you? Where are you? Why are you here? And how did you get here? And then where are you going? I'm Caroline Flanagan. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks, Caroline. That was, really was fantastic. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll just hand back over to Paulette uh, just to give uh, closing remarks. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think we are now at the top of the hour. And if it's possible to say thank you again, uh, Caroline, I will say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, that has been awe inspiring. It's been incredibly insightful. And thank you also in particular for the follow up tips at the end. I'm sorry, you said not to use the word tips, <laughs> um, but guidance, um, guidance, important steps and uh, important next steps. Um, so as always, everyone do stay connected with BSN for our upcoming events. Um, and of course, stay connected with Caroline um, so that we can find our power together and individually. Thank you all so much for attending and see you all soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye, have a lovely evening. Bye.